How to wait is a lesson every child has to learn. Are we there yet? Sometimes this waiting game isn't about a physical destination. Who's ever heard or maybe said, just wait until I'm 18, then you won't be able to boss me around anymore. It's a natural part of life. Are we there yet? Perhaps you've felt stuck in a job, wondering if you're there yet, what the future will hold, or you're waiting to get married or to welcome your first child into your home. For parents, waiting is part of the job description. We wait in doctor's offices. We wait outside the school or at a bus stop. We wait as we pick up our kids from rehearsals or sporting events. We wait for them to come home from a late night after being out. I remember when I was a kid, my mom always had a bag of knitting or crocheting to keep her busy while she waited. Today, we scroll through our phones. Are we there yet? Tonight, the question is likely about opening presents. Can we open our presents now? Please, 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 just one. It's almost Christmas. As much as waiting is an everyday occurrence, most of us don't enjoy waiting. We grumble and struggle through moments or even seasons of waiting. Though we try to control time and find instant solutions, we can't escape the reality that the world doesn't always run on our schedule. In fact, all of life can be viewed as one kind of waiting or another, and that's particularly true with Christmas. Are we there yet? In one sense, we are. The calendar says December 24th, we've lit the Christ candle. The clock will chime midnight in just a few hours. When we wake up in the morning, Santa will have come and gone. Christmas has arrived. but in another and perhaps more profound way. We still wait for Christmas. Over the last month, during the season of Advent, we've defined Christmas as when heaven touched earth. We remembered how a baby with a heavenly pedigree was placed in an earthly manger. We've seen a star shining in the east pointing to a newborn in the tiny town of Bethlehem. We've heard angels singing to lowly shepherds. We've celebrated that at Christmas heaven touches earth, that the eternal breaks into the here and now that God tears open the heavens and comes to us. Over the last month, we've said that at Christmas, the holiness of heaven touches the brokenness of earth. That perfect love washes away the imperfect. That love heals all that is bruised and unsatisfied within us. Are we there yet? For so many people around the world, 2023 has not been a good year. We've seen terrorism, a refugee crisis, wars, climate change, mass shootings, racism, sexism, bigotry, and the defraying of democracy. Countless individuals have been waiting for God to show up 
as they've struggled with a cancer that won't go away or a family that refuses reunion or a wound that won't heal. Are we there yet? The calendar says December 24th, and we've lit the Christ candle, and the clock will chime midnight in just a few hours. When we wake up in the morning, Santa will have come and gone, and it will be Christmas. And for those ready to receive it, heaven will touch earth again. You see, God didn't wait for the world to be at peace to come the first time. God didn't wait for poverty to end. God didn't wait for us to clean up our act. At Christmas, God came in the midst of our brokenness. The star shined in the darkness of the night. Love was born surrounded by hardship and strife. That's what it means for heaven to touch earth. That's what Christmas is about, that God came to us as one of us to walk with us on the rocky and rough road of life so that we might be drawn back to God. I first came to this truth in a profound way early in my ministry. I was right out of seminary, and of course, I had all the answers. I knew what was wrong with people. I knew what was wrong with the church. I knew what was wrong with the world, and I had the solutions to all these problems. And there came a time in my first year of ministry when I had concluded that if people would believe a little bit more, if the church would pray a little harder, if the world would live in truth and justice, then God would break into the world in a powerful way and the kingdom of God would come to earth, that justice would roll down and that all people everywhere would know the Lord. So I did what most young pastors would do. I sat down to write the ultimate sermon. A sermon that would make every other sermon unnecessary. And in that sermon, I detailed everything wrong with the church. I called out people for being lazy in their faith, for not being committed enough and not loving their neighbors. It was a masterpiece of a sermon explaining how God would come in power if we would just straighten up and fly right. And I titled the sermon, Is This God's House? The sermon was going to change everything. So I put the sermon title, on the sign in the front of the church building as an indictment. Is this God's house? And then on Sunday morning, I can still remember it. It it was a warm, sunny day in the spring, and I stood out on the sidewalk next to the sign, welcoming the poor, unsuspecting flock into the church as they came to worship. They had no idea what I had planned for them. And just as it was about time to go in and start the service, I saw Dale come around the corner, heading to church. Dale's not his real name. I'm calling him that to shield his identity. You see, Dale was an alcoholic, and he was struggling hard in recovery. I met with him several times as he was hitting rock bottom. After multiple DUIs, he lost his driver's license, his job, 
and custody of his kids. I found him to be a good guy when he was sober. He was educated and talented and generous and funny. Like most addicts, he would get on and fall off the wagon time after time. AA helped. But it seemed like every time he took two steps forward, he would take another step back. As Dale rounded the corner and approached the church building, before I could even say good morning, he stopped in front of the church sign and read the indictment that was my sermon title. And he looked at me and he scrunched up his face and he looked back at the sign and then he looked back at me and he said, I hope so, preacher, because I really need him right now. It was like a lightning bolt to my heart. We walked into the church together in silence. And as I walked up to the pulpit, I knew I couldn't preach that sermon that I had spent so much time preparing. In that instant, I was reminded that we don't have to have our lives all together before God shows up. I was reminded that we don't have to be changed before we are loved. It's love that changes us. I was reminded that in Jesus, God knows what it's like to be human, to be rejected, to be hungry, to be alone, to desire love, even to die. So that spring morning, instead of preaching an indictment, I preached Christmas. I preached Emmanuel, God with us, as one of us. And for me and Dale, at least, heaven touched earth that day. If God is willing to reach to us despite our sin, if the Messiah can be born to us through a frightened teenager, if the Prince of Peace can live among us under the oppression of a foreign empire, if the Son of God is willing to live our life and die our death, then certainly no addiction, no disease, no political crisis, no amount of fear or hatred or bigotry is too much for God to overcome. Christmas is God's answer to what's wrong with this world. At Christmas, we see pure love as a mother swaddles her baby. At Christmas, we see the glory of God as angels sing to shepherds. At Christmas, we see God's power breaking down walls as Persian kings bring gifts to a Jewish child. At Christmas, we see that God is not content to be a God off in the distance, trapped in eternity. At Christmas, we see that God wants to be involved in human life. At Christmas, God gives us a glimpse into what life should be.
Are we there yet? Heaven has touched earth. God is with us. Even in our pain. Even in our waiting. Christmas has arrived, but even now there's a new world coming. Are we there yet? Tonight, heaven is bending to earth. And right now, God is inviting you to draw close, to kneel at the manger, to bask in the light of the star. Don't ignore the invitation. Indulge me. This is the last time you'll have to do that. Indulge me tonight. And close your eyes. Go ahead. This is a safe place. Really close your eyes. Let the angels' song flood your mind. Don't ignore the invitation. Close your eyes and let the pure love of that newborn baby cleanse your heart. Maybe you're here tonight. And with your eyes closed in the quiet of the room, You realize this is the first time you've been able to relax since you don't know when. Don't ignore the invitation. Christmas is for the weary. Perhaps you're saying to yourself, yeah, I'm not really a religious person, Pastor. God's not really part of my life. I'm only here to keep peace in the family. It's okay if grandma dragged you here. Or even if you're here because you're trying to impress a girl. Don't ignore the invitation. The love of Christmas is big enough to include even the skeptic. Or maybe you've been a Christian for years. Maybe you said yes to Jesus long ago. But maybe there's a little part of your heart that you haven't yet surrendered. Maybe you struggle with a secret. Or maybe you're haunted by something in your past. Don't ignore tonight's invitation. Remember, we aren't made right with God by us being good enough. We're made right with God because Jesus was good enough. So no matter who you are, you can say yes tonight to the greatest gift of all time. Don't ignore the invitation. Christmas has come. God is at work tonight drawing the world to God's self.